Concluding our uh, morning session is, uh, well not concluding, we have a couple more talks, uh, but the first of these last uh, talks of the morning will be given by Robert Squirblies, who is currently finishing his PhD at the Freie Universität in Berlin on imports of Italian Renaissance paintings in Germany, especially Berlin, between 1797 and 1830. His study focuses on cultural policy, art trade, and personal networks in post-revolutionary Europe. Robert is associated with the research cluster Transnational History of Museums and to Art Transform, a project about the formation of German artists in France from 1793 to 1870. Both are located at the Technische Universität in Berlin and, run, and, are, and both are run by his professor, Benedict Savoy. Robert's earlier studies, also in Berlin, focused on art history, history, political science, and communication studies in Berlin and Rome from 2000 to 2008. Concurrent with those studies, he worked at the uh, Center of Contemporary History in Potsdam and at the Museum of Architecture of the Technische Universität in Berlin. As an editor, as well as, uh, he was also an editor for a local newspaper and for a publishing house in Göttingen and held internship positions at the state museums in Berlin and Potsdam. Recently, Robert has developed a special interest in the restoration and conservation of art, which has led him to contribute to a conference at the University of Geneva uh, three years ago. He published elements of his MA thesis on Edward Soley's painting collection in the Journal of the Berlin State Museums in 2009, and this is the uh, subject of his PhD thesis. Indeed, today we will have a sampling of that as Robert presents his paper on Connections Among Art Merchants, State Officials, and Academy Professors, Edward Soley and His Painting Collection in Berlin, 1813 to 1830. Please welcome Robert Skorblis. Um, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this conference, and it is really an honor to present my work to this audience. First, some uh, two quotations that show the myth that has been built around this collection, um, to which I would like to present some details in the following 20 minutes. Edward Sully was a businessman of his time. Born in London in 1776, as a member of a merchant family, he traded with wood and corn in the Baltic and North Sea region, together with his father and his brothers. They also collaborated with other families and companies, sharing ships and goods. At the time, distances were long, wars were waged, and bad weather was more than just an inconvenience. The company members took great risks but therefore each had a certain creative leeway in these dealings, and they were able to accumulate great wealth, provided that business was going well. Under these circumstances, Edward Sully was quite prosperous. For several years, he lived in Danzig, a hub of northern European trade. He also spent time in Memel and in Königsberg. Sully spoke German fluently and easily found access to the Prussian government. During the years of Napoleon's continental system, he supported the Prussian state with risky and even contraband trade transactions, as well as financial intermediation in England. The loss of seven ships that Sully's company owned together with another family in 1808 seems to stem from this kind of activity. These ships were captured and confiscated by the Danish Navy. As compensation for his losses, the Prussian state offered Sully a loan, the repayment of which became part of the negotiations for the sale of his painting collection. So we see here a very complicated mixture of political, economical, diplomatic and private networking. Not least, we get an impression of how vast Sully's and his family's assets must have been if they were able to maintain their own merchant fleet. The company most likely made its biggest profits when the year without summer of 1816, which was caused by a volcanic eruption in Tambora, resulted in a price increase for corn, 
that lasted several years, the very years in which Sully acquired his paintings. During this same time, Sully's partner Gibson was also able to build his own art collection in Potsdam near Berlin. It was probably during the beginning of the German campaign and the Napoleonic Wars around 1813 that Sully moved to Berlin. Details about his everyday life in Berlin are hard to find. As a merchant, he was often away from the city, and it is possible that he did not partake much in the local social life. For example, in documents of the salons, he is not mentioned. After around five years in late 1818, he left Berlin, returning later for only, shown, for only short stays of a few weeks or less. What was Berlin like as a city when Sully lived there? In 1820, it was still a small capital. London had around 1.5 million inhabitants and Paris about 720,000. In comparison, Berlin was home only to 200,000 people, around the same population as New York at that time. Some travelers describe Berlin as a dusty, spacious town, but nearly everyone points out its modernity and growth. Its university was founded in 1810 and soon became one of the most important ones in Germany. Planning for the art museum, which had begun in 1797, intensified after 1815. Music and literature were flowering. Although nearly erased from the map during the Napoleonic era, Prussia became a noticeable power in Central Europe after 1815. In fact, the very years in which Sully lived in Berlin were seen by many as the most hopeful time period between the liberation from the Napoleonic hegemony and time of the conservative restoration that followed soon after. For these reasons, I suppose that this window of time may have been the only chance to acquire an art collection as ambitious as Sully's. Let us visit Sully's house in Wilhelmstraße and take a look at his collection as it might have appeared in around 1818. We know little about Sully's house because it was demolished before 1861. Although it was in the prosperous and elegant outskirts of the city, it surely was not a noble palais like the famous ones of the families Strausberg or Ratzivill that were situated nearby. And Wilhelmstraße was not yet the heart of the administration. However, from the city map we learn that it was quite a big townhouse with two wings on the backside and a carriage house in the yard. It most likely had two main floors and one or two smaller ones above, if we consider the ordinary 18th century Berlin buildings. We do not know why Sully had a particular interest in art, more precisely, in old paintings. But it seems that he started to collect on Berlin, probably around 1815. The few hints he gives us lead us to assume that Sully was not just an eccentric lover of medieval artifacts or a collector of few precious works. In an 1829 letter to a friend in Berlin, he detailed his preferences for the early Italian Renaissance and Raphael. At that time, Raphael's work was generally admired all over Europe, especially in Germany and England. But interest in the art bef from before Raphael's time was quite new. The usual way collectors went about building a collection of high standard was, as we have seen, to begin with Raphael, Leonardo, and Correggio, and then to add the later Italian works and Flemish 16th and 17th century masters. In England, many collectors were also interested in Dutch genre paintings. Sully was an exception here. Dutch and Flemish paintings, he said, were just trading goods to him. The less fashionable, but ever more adored, older schools interested him, so much that he even tried to restore them with his very own hands, if we trust his acquaintances' remarks. So his collection was large. In the few years he lived on Wilhelmstrasse, and the two years that followed until the collection's sale in November 1821, he accumulated over 3,000 paintings. The store and gallery rooms were on the first and second floor of the house. There must have been some fluctuation in his stock of paintings, as this was the norm for art dealers, and Sully seems to have been more of a dealer than a stable art collector. The hints given in the sources 
lead us to believe that one floor contained the Dutch and German paintings, while the other one was reserved for the Italian pictures that were arranged more carefully. There were seven rooms filled with paintings. Karl Friedrich Schinkel, the architect of the Future Museum, noted that there were two rooms uh, for the Florentine masters and one room each of the Ferraris, the Venetian, and the Roman masters, this last being obviously the biggest, as it was divided into two parts. The big altar pieces were displayed on wooden constructions with smaller ones hanging on the walls or leaning against them. The first catalogue was made in the gallery with the paintings. And from this documentation, we have a sense not only of the order, but also of the aesthetic arrangements that might have been used. For example, these two little Madonnas, one attributed to Leonardo, one to Raphael, are mentioned one after the other. They have nearly the same dimensions and appear almost in the middle of the biggest rooms list. Obviously, they were hung as a pair, probably in the center of the hall. Who would have been able to visit Solly's collection? And how did visitors respond to it? In general, the collection was a private one, and its access was limited to friends, acquaintances, officials, and art experts. From 1819 on, the collection was loaned to the Prussian state, but remained in the house on Wilhelmstrasse. It was necessary to ask the responsible official at the ministry and Solis Handyman, who was living in the house, to unlock the gallery rooms together, for they, had, well, they each had one key for one of the two locks at the entrance. As we noticed before, Solis' house was more a stockroom than a gallery. Some rooms were surely arranged with care, but the quantity of several thousand pictures, many of them large, and painted on wood must have given a more than strange impression to many visitors. For example, Johann Wolfgang Goethe's son, August, visited the, the collection in 1818 and was shocked by the chaos he found. He said, even the kitchens and the carriages were filled with pictures. <laughs> it is therefore not surprising that opinions were quite different. The Berlin Art Academy's director, Johann Gottfried Schadow, claimed that only some pearls were spread into this pell-mell collection. He complained about the badly drawn green hallows, whose mass would simply cause him sad depressions the more time he spent in the house among them. Others praised the collection as a treasure. Schinkel was the most profound expert, and he pointed out the sheer size and the disorder of Solis' collection combined with the number of works which were unrestored or otherwise in poor condition made it difficult to estimate the high value this collection actually had. And he was right. Let us switch over to some statistics that may help to get an idea of the real content of Solis' collection at the moment of its sale to the Prussian state in 1821. It contained altogether, as documented in the early 1830s from the Ministry of Finances, exactly 3,012 pieces. Half of them can be doubtlessly identified as paintings still existing in Berlin or as paintings that did exist until at least 1887. A great amount is known only from an auctioneer's catalogue from 1887, when the director of the Gemäldegalerie, Wilhelm Bode, decided to sell paintings of little value from the museum's deposits, some of which had been ruined and or had disintegrated over the course of the decades. Most of those had been in the former Solly collection. Firstly, we look at regional provenances. Most striking is the significance of Italian paintings in the collection and its concentration on the Renaissance period. But some more details are very interesting. First, the exclusiveness. The collection did not contain, apart from very few exceptions, any French, Spanish, or English paintings. Secondly, there were a noticeable number of very old paintings. Thirdly, the quantity of newer works that has not survived to the 20th century is quite astonishing. In this figure, it shows, up, it shows us quite plainly that in fact most of the original collection, or stock as we will say, must have been from the Baroque era. This chart shows the genres that, we, that were represented in Solis' collection, and we needed little time to notice that 
A, the absolute majority of the paintings were of religious content and made for devotional purposes, and that B, nonetheless all classical genres have been represented. And finally, most of Solly's paintings were of a typical gallery format, though we recognize a noticeable amount of very large ones. So it was an exceptional, an exceptional collection, and Sully himself claimed that it would never again be possible, as had never been possible before, to collect hundreds of Italian Renaissance pictures as he did in just about five years. The key was the political situation in Italy, the vacuum of power after the fall of Napoleon there, and the effects of the secularization at the same time that set free thousands of mostly religious paintings in Italy. This, combined with the personal network that this powerful merchant had with art dealers and connoisseurs, and with his wealth and the lack of competition outside of England, enabled him to bring together such a large quantity of mostly really high quality paintings. So what process did Sully go through to make purchases? Unfortunately, all the documents Sully claimed to have obtained before or with his purchase of the pictures had already been lost by the time of the sale of his collection. However, we know that he had some personal contacts with art dealers in the Netherlands and Germany and Italy, where he probably never went himself, who acted as his commissioners. Just to give an example, one of those was Felice Cartoni from Rome, of whom we know only that he was originally a painter himself and that he bought and sold paintings in several art academies in Italy, such as Florence and Bologna. In Bologna, he introduced himself as a commissioner of Sully's, asking to buy some dozens of pictures from the academy's deposit, as he did in Florence too. Probably he shows the paintings himself with the assistance of local professors. The paintings were considered duplicates or minor works of Renaissance masters, but they were still important. Though the artworks were purchased by Cattoni, the criterion, on the other hand, must have been given by Solly and his art expert friends. Here we see a rare glimpse of these connections. It is a note from the papers of Christian Daniel Rauch. This Prussian sculptor, one of the heads of the Berlin Art Academy, traveled to Italy several times to chose marble for his own work and also to acquire statues and artworks for the future museum in Berlin. In 1817, he seems to have met Cartoni shortly before the latter's academy visits. And Rauch probably did not just say hello for Sully, but gave certain instructions about which paintings were of some interest and how much he was willing to pay. On the, on the one hand, Sully was picky and bought very expensive pictures that must have been either recommended to him by art experts in Berlin, such as Karl Friedrich Schinkel or uh, Louis Ludwig Hirt, or chosen by him for personal reasons. In most cases, he never saw paintings before, but he had himself sent drawings or prints, as was customary in the art market at the time. He spent big sums of money on several paintings. On the other hand, he acted like a wholesale dealer too. He bought up all lots of an auction or sales exhibition to pick out some single pictures and then resell the rest. We know of Italian art dealers that came to Berlin with a stock of paintings and the intention to make a good deal with the king. But the functionaries of the government refused the acquisition, letting Sully instead buy the ones that interested them on better terms with the goal of receiving the paintings at the end as a part of Sully's whole collection. The point is that Sully had private contact to a lot of noblemen and ministers. His second wife was the daughter of a higher Prussian statesman. The ministers of culture, of finance, and even the crown prince were close acquaintances of his. We could consider Sully more a mediator for the future museum than a private collector if it were not for the troubles with the sale of his collection. The earliest preserved inventory of about 800 of Sully's paintings was completed in autumn 1819. It was written by a functionary from the Ministry of Education, Friedrich Schulz, who was also a neighbor and a friend of Sully's. 
Very likely, Alois Hirt, one of the pioneers of art history and responsible for the future museum's collection building, collaborated with him. This inventory became the base for the sale contract of the Soli collection. Specifically, all of the paintings located in Soli's house in Berlin were passed by this contract officially onto the Prussian king, Frederick William III, for the sum of 500,000 thalers. The sale was the result of three years of tough and tedious negotiations, and only in 1828 were all of Sully's demands met. It was anything but an easy deal among friends. So why was the purchase of Sully's collection such a long process? We have to consider that the sum paid to Sully for his collection was enormous. The contract from 1821 sets 500,000 thalers as the price for Sully's collection. At that time, there was about $350,000. The whole state budget of Prussia for the year 1820 was 50 million thalers. Though paid by the king from his private funds, the price of Sully's collection was equal to 1% of the government budget. In other terms, in 1820, with a population of 9.6 9 million, the federal government spending in the US was 19.4 million. The price for the Sully collection would have been here nearly 2% of this. Imagine 1% of the US federal budget in 2012, which was 2.5 trillion, <laughs> would have been about $25 billion. Of course, we should not convert the sums from that time to our modern currencies and economies, but it helps to show how astronomic the price was, even if it was just half of what Saudi supposed his collection to be worth. In general, the political and economical situation in Prussia in the years after 1815 was quite hard, and many statesmen refused to spend bigger sums of public money on artworks. So the decision was kept secret for some months. Nonetheless, the state officials agreed with Solly and Hurt, who claimed the purchase of the collection to be a unique opportunity. The king himself was rather indifferent. His conservative camarilla, led by the Duke of, Wen uh, of Wittgenstein, fought against the acquisition for several reasons. It was through the work of Hardenberg, the Minister of Education and Culture Altenstein, and some high functionaries that the sale was finally realized by the end of 1821. The most important motive was the conviction that this stock of pictures was very useful for the future museum as it contained exactly those periods of art history that were barely represented in the existing royal collections. Secondly, despite the extraordinary sum of 500,000 thalers, it was still a bargain. And at least, Sully had some credit for his economic support and collaboration with the Prussian state during the continental system, which cost him, by his own account, a million thalers, in any case, a lot of money. When the rumor turned into news in October 1821 that Sully's company was going bankrupt, Hardenberg and his collaborator, the chief of the Prussian States Bank, Rota, reacted quickly to prepare and deliver the contracts for the purchase of the picture gallery, which helped to save Sully, who was in danger of ending up in prison. It was like a guarantee, followed soon by a massive bill of exchange made out for Sully. Let us recall the example of Cattoni's deal with the academies of Florence and Bologna and with Sully in Berlin. It was not new that former altar pieces of famous masters were sold out of Italian churches. Just think of Raphael's Sistine Madonna, bought by the King of Saxony in 1754 from the monks of San Sisto in Piacenza. Other aspects are more interesting, though. Firstly, the choice of certain paintings as examples not only for art that was considered as eternally beautiful, but to illustrate a history of art as cultural artifacts. Secondly, the importance of the modern state administration in these deals. In Italy, most paintings were not sold by representatives of the church or single collectors, as it had been usual in the 18th century, nor was Sully an ordinary private collector. It was the state who owned and sold or bought the pictures after the revolutionary changes on property. In Florence, the sale was combined with the purchase of some paintings from Bologna. And in Berlin, we can be sure that a picture like the now lost Virgin with Saints had been picked for its resemblance to Raphael's Saint Cecilia in Bologna, itself triumphantly brought to Paris and then returned to Bologna as a national treasure. 
It was the modern state that appeared as an actor to build up public art collections, as, for instance, the Prussian officials in the Ministry of Science and Culture explained in some reports that they distinguished between genres and masters that were estimable, schätzenswert, for the museum, and others that were of no interest at all, although these paintings were exp expensive on the art market, such as the Dutch genre paintings of the 17th century. This educational idea would have greatly influenced Sully in his purchases, whether he planned from the beginning to sell his paintings to the state or not. We should not forget that the price was important too. In Berlin, it is obvious that the paintings of Raphael, Tizian, or Correggio were seen as the climax of art history and were also well known as the most expensive ones. The point was to accumulate not copies, but the very closest masters to these genuises in as many examples as possible. Summed up, they should lead to a rebirth of art, or at least give a stimulus to young artists and some education to the public. However, it is worth asking, even if Sully won't give us the answer, why pictures that were not considered to be as pleasing as a Baroque Susanna in her bath, or as entertaining as a Dutch genre painting, but were instead somewhat mysterious and aesthetically unconventional as the late medieval and early Renaissance paintings were, why they captivated so many early 19th century intellectuals and amateurs, such as Sully surely was. Perhaps the experience of a world that was changing so profoundly, as it did in the years after the French Revolution, improved the fascination that a calm, devotional, and fine artwork like Filippo Lippi's Adoration or a Bellini Pietà gave to the spectators. Moreover, we should not underestimate the importance of the conservative authorities in the Restoration era. King Frederick William built a so-called Holy Alliance together with the Tsar and the Austrian Emperor, and even in their secularized existence in a public museum, the severe religious paintings had their impact on the visitors that remained subjects instead of becoming citizens. But let us come back to Edward Sully. What was his reputation in Berlin? It is not astonishing that a foreigner and intimate of powerful statesmen, a merchant who was richer than the wealthiest Prussians, seemed suspicious to many Berliners. The intellectual Van Hagen van Enze even called him an imposter, and the supporters of the patriotic art, that is, the old Dutch and German paintings, that Sully did not appreciate but rather bought and sold for speculation, were especially not in favor of this stranger. His advisors, perhaps Alois Hürth and surely Karl Friedrich Schinkel, and Gustav Friedrich Wagen, the first director of the Berlin Picture Gallery, and famous expert known especially in England, were his friends. Sully himself was not considered, though, to be an art expert, not yet. In England, however, when the public debate took place to found a national gallery, Sully was asked to give his advice. Together with Wagen, he gave expert testimony in front of a parliamentary commission. At this point, he was regarded as a connoisseur. This was in the 1830s, and he claimed that he owed his connoisseurship to his Berlin experience. In 1829, he wrote a letter to a friend in Berlin, most likely Wagen, from his London apartment, where he was surrounded by old paintings of which he stated that, without them, I could not be. Sully's influence himself on the museums of his time is difficult to estimate. In the early 1840s, he offered his new collection of paintings to Berlin, but in vain. Several auctions took place over the course of the years until the last one in 1847, after his death. Still, it was the coup of 1821 that led from 1830 on to an institutional interest in old Italian art when the painting gallery in Berlin opened its doors and became a model not just for dozens of provincial museums in Germany, but for museums all over the continent. It is very likely that the English interest in these works that had been marginal up to that point grew significantly because of the contact with Wagen and the impression the new Prussian museum made on its visitors who came from all over Europe. In several Italian states, collections and museums were founded or modified. The exposure which artworks were receiving on the other side of the Alps led to increased attention to the works still existing in Italy. 
The painting gallery of Berlin was therefore a step towards a modern idea of the museum not only as a treasure chamber, but also as a temple for cultural heritage. I leave the last words on this matter to an American visitor, the writer Mary Shelley, who traveled to Berlin in 1836 and who was overwhelmed by what she saw in the museum. The Gallery of Berlin will, I fear, become a vague, though glorious dream for the most part, leaving distinct only a few images that can never be effaced. Thank you. <laughs>